Okay, so Be'ezra Hashem, we're going to be continuing with the end of the Hakdama to Hakdama Susha'arim. And we're picking up where the Leshem has already explained the entire kind of corpus of his library. He explained Hakdama Susha'arim, he explained Deya, he explained Biurim, he explained Klalim. He already went through the rationality behind the need for all people to learn this content, Kabbalah, Pnimiya Satara, because it is part and parcel of the entire Torah. It also transcends the rest of the areas of Torah. And now the Leshem is going to, and, and again, the Leshem also eased us into what it means to learn or begin to learn a new topic or a new subject in the sense that the language will always be foreign because it's impossible to be familiar with the language until you become familiar with it. And so the language is going to be, appear foreign prior to your familiarity with it. And now the Leshem we're going to see is going to now reveal a little bit of himself. Most of the time the Leshem is a conveyor of information, is teaching information, but there are times where the Leshem's neshama comes out in the writing itself. And we identified this with the fact that Rav Moshe Shapiro said that the writings of the Leshem are unique in the sense that they are both conveyors of content, they are svarim of Torah, but at the same point they are also the receptacle or the resting place of the soifer, of the author, the neshama of the author who gave over those ideas. So that when one is learning Leshem Shabal Bachaloma, one is in truth coming in contact with Leshem Shabal Bachaloma, Rav Shlomo Al Yashiv Aleinu, and we see in his writings very often where the excitement over the content that he's describing carries him away and he has to bring himself back with Al Kol Panim or HaKadosh Baruch who should give me forgiveness for spending too much time in writing and revealing. But here in the Haktam of the Leshem is going to touch upon a little bit of who he is. Why did I go through all of this introductions about these order of books? Because when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to grace me and merit me, that the words and the teachings that I am conveying in this book should be understood in the eyes of those who understand. Again, the eyes of those who understand. This I absolutely love. What the Leshem is saying is that really, if people come and understand what I'm saying, then maybe some of the rich Nigidim will come and give money to publish my writings. Here we have Rosh Shlomo Al Yashiv, wondering about who is going to publish his farm. Right, which tells you that what a person sees in the Heshtalshlos of Torah Shebechsav and Shebaal Peh, what appears to be symptomatic of human frailty or human struggle, is in fact true in all accounts. It's true by the Tzadikim, it's true all the way up to Moshe Rabbeinu, Rav Ganalenu, where he was mitparnes from the leftovers of the Luchos, from the shavings of the Luchos, meaning... When the Torah comes down, it also comes down with a desire and seeking out the vessels necessary, the Yisachar, the Zavulin element of it, the Yachinu Boaz that supports that Torah. That is part and parcel of the Torah itself. So here the Leshem is literally asking. He's saying maybe one or two Nedivim, Ha'ashirim, who desire closeness to God and yearn for the word of Hashem, that they'll take upon themselves the responsibility for publishing these svarim. And in order to bring merit to the rabbim, because in truth, you know, my strength has diminished to a great degree because of the burden of what it means to be a human being, and old age has jumped upon me prior to its time. All of these are really poetic expressions. Again, when the Leshem speaks a little bit about himself, it's Kedai to be Medayik in those words, because we have his Torah, which is his Neshama, but to gain a glimpse of who the Leshem was as an individual. I was watching the other night, I was watching the video of Rebbe Yashav, Rabbi Yosef Shalom al of learning. Anybody ever see this video? It's like a half hour of him learning on his own. And after a while of just watching this, this mysterious creature kind of learn Torah, you begin to realize, like, wait a second, this is the grandchild of the Leshem Shabbat Bachaloma. And you begin to realize that, you know, it's not so far off that these people actually, these tzaddikim populated the earth. The Leshem continues and he says, V'Hashem Yodeya Ma Acharai. Only a Kaddish Baruch who knows what the end is going to be. And I 
And HaKadosh Baruch Hu has given me the merit to write these L'chabram ul ha'loysam al-aksav to write them and to place them upon the pages. Hu yechaneni l'roysam yatsu min adfus v'am mefursamim b'ina chachamim. He himself will be the one who gives me the merit to be able to see these words published and popularized amongst the wise ones. So again, what the Leshem has stressed up until now is how powerful the Sefer is, how this Sefer should be a stand-in for all the other forms of Pnimiya Satora, how there should be no necessity of looking anywhere else. This Sefer is good for the beginner, it's good for the novice, it's good for the individual who knows already. The Leshem is asking for money, he believes in his book. Now the Leshem continues. When it comes to all of these books, I refer to them in one general name, that it's the third row of stones on the breastplate, and there's an acronym of the Leshem's name, Shlomo Yashiv in Leshem Shvoi Vachaloma, Vuhu Yechalkel Basocho, Chelke Drushim, Vachelke Habiurim, Vachain Sefer Hakadosh Shelafaninu. And this general category of names, Leshem Shvoi Vachaloma, comprises the three elements of the general writings. There's the Drushim, which we said were Drushe Olamatohu, Chelak Aleph and Beis, and the Klaleh Haspash. The Biurim were the Biurim on Eitzchayim Kadisha, which only went up to Shah Nikudim, which is the very beginning, but it already extends 300 or so pages. And then Sefer HaKadosh. One can say that the Shem HaKlali of Lashem Shavuot Vachaloma, which are the three stones of the breastplate, sequestered themselves off into these three Zramim of the Drushim, the Biurim, as well as HaKadosh. What the Chilak would be in each of them, we would have to kind of spend some time on, Bezra Sashem. Hinehu gamkein anaf echad mimenu, shem echad lekulam. They're all coming from the same place and they all have the same name. Ubeprat ki harei hu rak sefer katan. This book in front of us is a small sefer. V'nichla b'chilek b'hakol. Right, and the chilek, like we said before, the part is contained within the whole. Here the Leshem is again using some of the deepest fundamental ideas of Kabbalah and using them to describe the process of publication. Right, he said this before, that the derech of learning in Torah is that wherever you look, you're going to find everything. Right, and that's why, because the Torah is a coal, and when it's a coal, even the chilek contains the whole within it. And here the Leshem seemingly describing why he's publishing this Sefer, which seems to be outside the category of his other writings, along with the other writings, he's again hinting to this secret that ki ki rak sefer katan v'nichlal ha-chilek b'hakol, and the chilek is nichlal in the whole. Nevertheless, in spite of the fact that they're all unified in one general umbrella, I refer to them each with their own identifiable names. Again, that's the secret of Klaliyut and Pratiyut, right? That there's the Klal, but the Klal does not negate the Pratiyut, but rather the Pratiyut exists within the Klal in a way that the particularized titles of the books embolden and enlarge the general category of the writings of the Lashem Shavu Achaloma. Me'ata, and now... And ain ata el right? Chazal tell us that there's no utilization of the word ata except when one is moving into tshuva. Hinini oimer bepemale. I am announcing with a full voice. Ki hagam shetehila lekel yisparach shemo. That thank God shani hamachaber mikol osan hasvarim haniskarim. That I have merited to be the author or the scribe of these books. Im kol Nevertheless, hine yodeya ani baatzmi. I know deeply within myself she'en bi lo Torah velo yira lo chachma velo tuna. I have no Torah and I have no fear. I have no wisdom and I have no understanding. Lo das velo etza. I have no knowledge and I have no ability to apply that knowledge to suggestion. Va'ani nibze v'chadal ishim. I am a lowly and destitute individual. Ve'en ze elarak mechazdo uvetuvo shavak kadosh baruch hu. And all of what you see in front of you is nothing but an expression of the goodness and the grace of a kadosh baruch hu. She'he for he has disclosed and revealed through me and through my actions, or the actions of my hand, and he has given me the strength to write all of this. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu can carry out his shlichus, what needs to get done by anybody, irrespective of who they may be. Like Chazal tell us in Bereshis Rabbah, Perak Yud, I am simply a pen. 
There are other tzaddikim who use this language. The Chida used this language. Rabbi Nachman used this language. This language hints, as many mechabrim have pointed out, to a certain idea that Rav Chaim Vital himself was speaking about, which is some form of automatic writing that is engaged when a person descends into a deep meditative state. I'm not claiming there are certainly claims that this is what the Lashem is referring to here, that he was literally a pen for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he wrote beyond himself. And one does see that in his writings, that he wrote, there's a seemingly almost impossible element to the writings of the Lashem where he has the ability to meander, 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 meander without ever losing the central most point meaning he can spend pages and pages and pages in an apparent divergence away from the idea he started with, and then he'll suddenly hit you with a va'al kol panim and bring you right back to the point where you departed in that tangent. You see this, in my humble opinion, also in the writings of Rabbi Nassim. And Rabbi Nassim of Nimr of Shus Aganelin writes numerous times, to daven to be a pen, to daven to be able to, to be the, the pen through which HaKadosh Baruch Hu expresses himself. And the Leshem, we know, what we do know about the Leshem is that the Leshem would be toivel before he made the ink for his writing. So he took the writing act seriously, very seriously, to the extent that he was able to refer to himself through absolute bittal and self-nullification in the healthiest of ways, that the anirak ke'et bazeh, I am just like a pen in this process, the hayet payer ha'garzan ala bo, and is the tool going to embolden itself and be proud of itself and beautify itself in the in the face of he who holds that tool. The chen hayispire ha eight seifer la koisevo, and will the pen of the scribe take pride in face of the scribe utilizing that pen? The whom may nifloos tamim deim yisparach shemo. And all of this is from the wondrous principles of HaKadosh Baruch HaShem Imenu Lo Yifla Kodavar, to whom absolutely nothing is impossible. Umisha Amar L'Shem En V'Yed Lo'Yikhu Yoyimer L'Chaim Etzriyelok. You see how the Lashem is describing himself. That just as HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that oil can illuminate and it can be used to create a flame, so too vinegar can as well. That's the Gemara that teaches us how nothing means anything in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu because everything is everything. As the Lashem says at the heart of Deya, HaKol Hu Bakol, Teva, Nes, it's all part and parcel of the same expression. And the Lashem is saying just as HaKadosh Baruch Hu can take anything and utilize it for his purposes, so too HaKadosh Baruch Hu take me and use me as his pen. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu has also graced me and blessed me with all of this. From the immense treasure trove of a free undeserved gift. As it is written, One can say that not only is the Leshem desiring that HaKadosh Baruch Hu give him the brachos of the Yid Gimel Midas of Rachamim in order to write, but that in truth the Leshem is also hinting to the fundamental expressions of his writings, which are the Yid Gimel Midas Arachamim. Nobody like the Leshem Shavu Chaloma goes down into the Yid Gimel Midos and the Yud Gimel Tikunim Digna and the Yud Gimel Midas Arachamim and how they apply even in worlds where we can never conceive them as applying. The, the Gantz writings of the Leshem Shavu Chaloma are Ma'oira Rachamim Rabin. That's the core of these teachings. The core of these teachings is that this is how HaKadosh Baruch Hu fears the Welt. This is how Hashem desired it to be from the beginning of time. Your personal narrative to one degree or another, while fundamentally significant in every aspect of significance, nevertheless bears absolutely no chance of disrupting the ultimate plan that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has. The Neira Alila Al Bnei Adam. And what a person does at that point is they transition away from their feeling that I have earned this, which is the 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 schus avos, and it goes back to a place of complete undeservedness, which is the bris that was nichras with the avos, which is that lemalamitam vedas. It's the hanhagas hayichud that the Ramchal describes so often that really it's all just racham and rabin, and that's what the leshem shuvah vachaloma is bringing down again into his writings. <clears throat> The Alav Bakashti and it's Hakadosh Baruch Hu who I have beseeched and requested. Shal Titreif Alai Asasha Achas V'Shalom. Don't take me before it's my time. V'Yechaneni Oid LaHashlem Chavtsi V'Tikvasi Mimenu Yisbar Shemo. And give me the ability and grace me with the capacity to fulfill my desires and my hopes for Him. May Koidesh Koidesh Hakadoshim from the the holiness of the holy of holies. Laman Shemo Yisbar Shem V'Yisale LaAd Amen. Netzach Tzela V'Ed. Nuum Shlomo Ben Laaviv Moira Virabo Hamaschase Demkono Rav Chaim Chaikel Ben Rav Aryeh Zechert Sadik Kadush Lebracha 
Uleimi my Rasi and my mother, Isha Yiras Hashem, a woman who feared God, he tisalel Marat Stira Gita Basrav Yitzchak Zecher the Bracha Asher Lefi Masha Kabalti Me Zikne Mishpachti, and I have received from the elders of my family, Hinani Hain Mitzad Advi, Hain Mitzad Imi, both from my father's side and my mother's side, Megeza Ha'ariza. I come from the Arizal, and we've described this before, how the Rashash of Shalom Sharabi and the Leshem Shabbat Chaloma are not to be considered giluyim of their own. They are to be considered, in the perspective of many, as a makkah b'paddish, kind of a finalization or a, a, a finishing to the gilui of the Arizal. The, the Leshem is not saying anything that the Arizal was not saying. Even when he's saying things that the Gros said that Ariza doesn't seem to say, the Leshem Zavoda, like Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver, was to come and show how really everything the Gros is saying is from the Arizal. And so the Rashash was the same way. The Kafachayim brings down that when the Arizal passed away, he said, if you merit, I'll come back to you to be Mavara things. And they asked how, and the Kafachayim said it was the Rashash who came down to be the Makkah B'Pattish. So here we see the Leshem tracing himself, both from his father and his mother, both his Chachma and his Bina, to the Arizal. And and from one side, Hinigam Ken Me Geza Harav Hakadush, Marina Arav Shimshan, Me Astropolia, Zecha Lebracha, Viscusia Venalenu. And I believe also the Leshem doesn't say this, but Hashem Nim Komdomo as well. That we spoke about Rav Shimshan Me Astropolia last week and how he was from Machanadan and why his farm were all about Machanadan and why Leshem is the stone of Dan and how that Shaykh to Purim and to the Avod of Esav and all of those in Yanim. Rav Shimshan Me Astropolia was known as Mashiach Ben Yosef because there was a time, I believe it was in the Gezerus of Tach that there was some Tukufa where the Jewish people were oimed by a, a Melech Kasha Kahaman, and I believe it was the Taz, the Shach, and Rav Shimshon Astropolia who gathered together and they came to the recognition that someone had to be Moiser Nefesh, that Mashiach Ben Yosef at this expression of Gula had to, had to be Neherag, and it was Rav Shimshon Astropolia who took upon himself the Mesir Nefesh for Klai Yisrael, and he was killed in the Tach Tat revolutions. And that's why he's so fundamentally famous, in particular for his. Uh, for his Ramazim right before um, Leil Seder when everybody reads that Mikhtav Hayedua about the Asar Makos because that's the Hisarius to Geula. We know from the Arizal that when the Tzadikam and Moisir Nafsham, whether it's Bechayim Chayusam or Bemisasam Chas Vishalom, that that is Oila the Hisarius Melamata Lamala for the incoming Geula. So to directly connect ourselves to Rav Shimshan Ma'astropolia on Erev Pesach, which is the Hisarius for Geula, makes a lot of sense. Here we're going to skip, because here the Leshem is going to go into the tefillah of Rav Nechunya ben Hakana. It's a profoundly powerful tefillah. It's tefillah sayichud, the Rav Nechunya ben Hakana. And it goes into all sorts of Ramazim, and it goes into names, and it goes into the Shem Membez. I highly recommend anybody who wants to kind of be nichnas into the Sefer to, to read the Tvila, to read the, the Leshem Sakdama, but again, it hints to what the Leshem was capable of doing, uniquely so that in addition to <coughs> his, his honest and, and fundamentally holy transmission of the teachings, he was also very much involved in manuscript work. A lot of the manuscripts that we have from the writings of the Ramchal, a lot of the manuscript work that was done on commentators of various forms of the Eitz Chaim, even the students of Rav Shalom Sharabi, a lot of this was done by Rav Shlomo al -Yashiv. So we see that he was uncovering and excavating different texts because he believed so desperately in these texts themselves. Any questions on the Hakdama, Bechla? Yeah. Um, only because, only because I think it's you know not, it's mechzi kiyuhara to to pretend to even begin to know what any of it means. You know, a tefillah is written, and on the other hand, on the other hand, if the leshem put it first, you know, we should read what the leshem put first because that's obviously how we wanted the sefer to start. So the pshar will be that like there's a very real reason why it's specifically in the easiest sefer that the leshem is conveying to the masses that in between the hakdama and the beginning of the sefer is this heilaga tefillah from Rav Nechun ben Akana, the Baal of the Anav Paya, the Duda Simincha, and the Shem Membez, as we understand it, and it's a tefillah that goes into the to, to the lights of Keser. It speaks about the Tarach Amudei Or, which is a, a unique concept that the Vilna Gon utilizes a lot, with Tarach being the Gematria of Keser, um, which is the 613 mitzvos of Taryag, plus the Shavu Mitzvos B'nai Noach, which, and, and also the Darabanans that are on top. So it's a, it's a fundamental connection piece, but the only thing I would say is to, is to read it with Kavana, you know, and to believe in the Tzvila afterwards. These, <clears throat> when he negates himself, 
mm -hmm. and they call themselves a, a pen. Mm -hmm. Is that typical of the Sadiqi Makubalan that he says, I'm nothing. I mean, yeah. uh, is, he means, Bittal, of course, that... Bittal is the only way that there's ever uh, an expression of or insult in this world. Balatanya writes, Mufurish in Tanya, and it's based on the Arizal, and he also is Mesiach Isipak to the Rambam, that ain ain or ain soif shayra ella al mashe batl batachlis habitl, which is why that the chachma of Adam Kanma is what's necessary to create the world of Atzilus. Chachma bitl is the fundamental gateway into being a kli ra'ui to being mamshech Torah. Okay, bitl entail, what he's really saying, I imagine, is that Kaddish, any milas that he has is from right. gift from a Kaddish Exactly, okay. exactly. But he doesn't phrase it that way. Well, he just spent he just spent the last three pages praising his product, right? He just spent that's the, that's the right. Problem. But that's I mean, but that's exactly Rabbi Nachman says about you want to know how Moshe Rabbeinu was the biggest anav in the world, and how do we know he was the biggest anav? Because he wrote that he was the biggest anav in the world. Bittel is not a negation, God forbid, of one's strengths or one's personality strengths. It's the utilization of those strengths with the simultaneous awareness that these do not come from my own merit. I have not earned these things. Avram Avinu believed in Hashem and he saw his ability to believe in Hashem as a tzedakah from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's a certain trend that is revealed in, in, most, in most svarim of Pneumia Satora and it comes out one way or the other that we tend to look at the world as being split into two processes. Isarusa de la tata and Isarusa de la ela, a motivation from below and expression from above. And we tend to assume that the motivation from below is the necessary volitional human buy-in of effort to desire to grow, which brings about an eventual growth. But what the Svarim point out is that even the motivation towards the desire to change is coming from a preceding and a pre-existent influence that's coming from above. Meaning to say that Hashem is driving even our most powerful thoughts of tshuva. And Hashem is driving every thought that emerges into our hearts of wanting to come close to Him. That's also from Hashem. And so the capacity to recognize one's strengths, to utilize those strengths. The unhealthy thing here would have been to not write a book. Because I'm nothing. But what about the, the non Kabbalistic literature? Mm -hmm. Do you find anything like that there? I think that in Chazal itself, Chazal have an incredibly delicate, delicate relationship to arrogance, humility. But do they, do they the self-negation? The self, the statements of self-negation. That seems to be like in the Kabbalistic literature, isn't it? I think there's. A, you're absolutely right. There's a deeper sense of undeservedness here. Right? We're talking about politics of secrecy, and in the in the healthiest way imaginable. These ideas are powerful. And the more powerful one believes these ideas to be, the more unworthy they feel that they are. And any time these writings were kind of condensed into writing was an aspect of an Eis Laso Slashem Hifu Sarasecha. And so, meaning the Arizal, Rav Chaim Vital, you see that in these teachings, a prerequisite to being deserving to convey the teachings is a feeling of undeservedness. So basically they're addressing the Eis Laso Slashem, that there shouldn't be any kitra of Mashu, because I can't say what the what the exact motivation was. The the Tzvila Tzadik, the Bluzhever writes, the Bluzhever writes that the entire Hisayrus to the Eis Lasos Lashem Hifru Sarasecha that was Goyrim, the publication of Tarish Balpe, came about because we saw the Eis Lasos Lashem Hifru Sarasecha that Rashbi did when writing down the Zohar. So that there's a certain kind of willingness to convey into writing with the acknowledgement that I am unworthy of, usually a person doesn't write anything other than what they are capable of understanding. And to be capable of understanding these matters means to be of a particular spiritual level where you're experiencing them. So the very act of writing is already going against. And plus, we have to understand that in the literature of the Zohar and in Rav Chaim Vital and his Haktama to the Eitz Chaim, the prerequisites necessary for a person to enter into these limudim is, is a long, vast list of character refinement to a remarkable degree. And surprisingly, or really unsurprisingly, the central point of all of it is Midos Tobos. Not only is that the prerequisite, but when you learn the deepest places in the Rashash, it all comes down to me, those tovos as well. But so the act of writing in, in this space is one that, in, in the healthiest way, is one that announces that I, I own my ability to write this, but I don't own my having earned my ability to write this.
Does that make sense? The seder. I mean, again, and, and then just the, before beginning, but it, with all these prerequisites, how can we, you know, how can we at this point begin to learn them? So there's another tzad, and, and that's that everything we're learning, everything we're learning when it comes to Panimiya Satora is to one degree to another, and again, owning the biases here is, is through the revolution initiated by the Balshem Tov HaKadosh. Now, the Balshem Tov HaKadosh was not an individual who came and taught a particular system of teachings. The Balshem Tov was a historical revolution. It was a unique expression in the grand history. And we spoke about the other tzaddikim and the various constellations of that galaxy that kind of existed at the same time. But one of the innovations of the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh is that instead of learning Panimiya Satora from the perspective of deservedness and being on the operating level where I can really have a full grasp, there's also a, a bottom-up type of way, which is learning Panimiya Satora for the sake of survival, which is learning Panimiya Satora like a drowning individual who feels that this is quite literally the only thing that can possibly give me the strength to float a little bit more. And you see this already. This notion is at the heart of the publication of the Arizal's writing as well. Rav Yaakov Tzemach, the Tzemach writes, why are these teachings being revealed at such a later point in history? Because in accordance with the sickness is going to be the medicine that is provided. Right? That in accordance with the sickness of the times, when there's more concealment, more struggle, more difficulty, it becomes more and more fundamental for an individual to grab hold of these teachings. And the Zidit Shavar Tzadikim famously said they wanted young children learning Zoyar and Arizal from a very young age. And people would say, you know, but how can you say to learn these things? Don't you have to be Kadosh and Tahor in order to learn these things? And he says, I understand your question well, but how can one be Kadosh and Tahor without learning these things? So at a certain point, there is an Eis La Sos La Hashem. And when a person is learning Lashma, with vulnerability for these teachings to kind of mend their heart. So at that point, I believe that as the tzaddikim say, permission is granted to all who desire to enter. And the lahat hacher famisapechas that blocks Gan Eden stops moving so quickly. Shar Aleph, Perak Aleph. Yesoid hachachma v'shoresh ha The foundation of wisdom and the root of Kabbalah, which is Rosh Teva Savaya. Asher diber ner Hashem aleki Rav Yitzchak Luria Hakadosh yidid mi betan that and again that's the Rosh Hashanah of Adnus and Eloikim as well that these are the teachings that were taught over by the candle of Hakadosh Baruch Hu the godly the saintly Rav Yitzchak Luria who was refined and holy from the womb who conveyed these teachings elatam lad yashar neeman vasik ish chayim daydenu again all we have is what Rav Chaim Vital has given us from the Arizal. Yes, we have a few writings of the Arizal, but Chaim, Rav Chaim Vital is Ne'eman Beso, Lo Yamush Meisecha Ohel. What we have is the Kabbalah of Rav Chaim Vital. Zecher Shneim Lebracha Lechayo Elam Haba. Leida Ulehadia. So what's the Tachlis of all of this? To know and to make known. Again, to know and to make known. The responsibility of knowing is now I have the responsibility of also making it known. Ki Hashem Elekeinu. These two names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem Elokeinu, Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov, Elokei Yisrael. And the bolding of the names is because the Leshem would bold the names also in his Kisveyad. Which means that there's an inherent holiness. There's a segula of the text itself. Hinehu levado beretzono hatov himtsia kol hanimsaim, bara kol hanivraim, yatser v'yoitser kol hayitzurim, v'asa v'oisa kol hamaasim. That the tachlis is to make known that he alone, Hakadosh Baruch Hu bechvaydo yuvatzmo kaviachol, alone, biritzono hatov, with his desire towards goodness. That desire towards goodness is hinting to what the Arizal writes in Shara HaKlalim and what the Ramchal makes very popular as the fundamental reason for the creation of the world, which is choy katoiv lehetiv, that the fundamental desire, so to speak, of the ultimate good is to bestow good, which is the source of the creation of the world. So here the Leshem is saying, Hu levado beritzono hatov, his ratzon is a ratzon of tov, him tzia kol hanimtsaim, has made all of existence present, bara kol hanivraim, he has created all of the creations, yatzer v'yotzer kol hayitzurim, he is 
has formed and is perpetually forming all of formations. The asa the osa kol ma'asim, and he has created and is perpetually creating all of creation. So here we have the three worlds that the Arizal discusses, which is Oilam Habriya, which is the language of Bara Kol Anivraim, Oilam Hayatsiru, which is Viyatsir Vyoitsir Kola Yitsurim, and Oilam Maasiya, which is Asa the Oisa Kola Maasim. So I want to read a little bit till the beginning of this paragraph, and then the Leshem kind of has an ad addendum to the reason that he shifts in the language over here. Yeah. <coughs> He does not use laheda ulahamin, laheda ulahodia, meaning he uses to know and to make known. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I, I, I mean, look, it's not, it's not unreasonable whatsoever to say that the Leshem is, is engaged in a response to one degree or another with the writings of the Ramchal. That's something we know historically speaking. Whether or not this is an instantiation of that, I'm not sure. But either way, one can extrapolate a difference. I mean, what would you see the difference as being? Right. I think that Lehidah Ula I remember learning in, in Derech Hashem. I remember Shana Aleph learning Derech Hashem. And it starts off, Tzarich Kol Isha Yisraeli, Lehidah Ula so I close the book after like 30 minutes. I'm like, Lahamin, I get. But Leida, to know something with any element of certainty is already something that, that puzzles me from being able to read the book because no one can know anything with certainty. So what I would say over here is that there's a certain meekness, a holy meekness to say, Leida ulaha amin. To, to know and then to believe that I know. Over here, in terms of hafatza, and it's more powerful, and it's more of like it's a es la sos la shem, if you know it, you gotta teach it at this point. Stop, you know, don't be so, don't be so small in, in needing to believe in it so much, you, you teach it. So, so over here, so, so the Leshem continues. And he says that Akadush Baruch Hu in his Ratzon Hatov has made all of existence present, has created all creations, formed and forms all formations, has made and continues to make all actions. And he gives sustenance and he gives life and continued existence at every moment. Meaning to say, the entirety of existence in all of its fullness. From the moment that they were made available, that they came into existence, the Cholzman Kiyumo, as well as the continuity of its existence, meaning from the starting point and the continuation from that starting point, Hine Koil His Habusa Tamid Hurak Mimenu, all upkeep and all continued existence and all emergence into being of everything is always perpetually only from Him. Shehu Noisa Oisai Tamid Bechol Melua. For he, so to speak, he over here is representative of the or ein sof bechvaydu of atzma that we have not even begun to be able to grasp what that might mean. But he carries everything. Noise, right? That's the Indian that Hakadosh Baruch Hu is referred to as a makom. That Hakadosh Baruch Hu, look, if you look in the second footnote over here, it says ayin bebi or kine hamakom. Hamakom means that Hakadosh Baruch Hu is carrying everything within himself. All of existence takes place within the space that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has carved out for it, but not something outside of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hu mekomo sha'olam ve'en ha'olam mekomo. So what we are stating as a first postulate is that everything that has come into existence, all of the gradations of existence, the worlds of separation, all of it both emerges from HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself and all of it continues by way of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's strength itself. Is he, is he adding anything to the Rama? Is he adding anything to the Rambam? We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I, I don't know necessarily if he's adding anything to the Rambam right now. All of the particularization of this is adding to the Rambam. All of the names. But the Leshem writes very simply here. He says, all we have before Simpson is Rambam. All we have after Simpson is, is the Arizal. After Hashem has allowed existence to come into being is already a language of after Tzimtzum. Because Tzimtzum is the things that allows existence to come into being. So if we're talking post-Tzimtzum here, then he is coming to add a, a significant 
amount on the Rambam in the sense that not only is HaKadosh Baruch Hu the source and the upkeeping of all of existence, but at the same point he carries all of existence, who noisa hakol, the mashkiach b'chol, and there's also a hashgacha, a hashgacha pratis on everything, every single thing, hakol b'lihafsik, which is already Yitzhiya from the Rambam, uman higes hakol tamir raku levado, and he is perpetually driving and governing all of it, him alone, him in absolute isolation. Ve'in shum davar bilado mu'umo klal, and there is absolutely nothing other than him whatsoever. Yeah? And so there's an interesting thing over here. When we look at the language that the Arizal uses to describe these three worlds that we're going to come in contact with, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was Bara Kol HaNevra'im, Yatsar V'yoytzer Kol HaYitzurim, Asa V'oysa Kol HaMaasim, by Yatsar, by the world of Yitzira, we see Yatsar V'yoytzer. We see that he formed and he continues to form. By the world of Asiya, we see Asa V'oysa, that he created and he continues to create. But by the world of Bria, we don't see this dual language of hubara ubaira as if there was a perpetual state of a beginning of creation and the continuity of creation. But And the Leshem is going to identify, identify why he makes that distinction. Everybody hears the Kasha? So Leshem writes as follows in the Hagom Miksavyad HaMachaber. This was written as an adenendum in the handwriting of the Machaber. Ubara kol and why are we focusing only on the single language there? Nira be'enai. Again, he's, he's nira be'enai. It, it appears that this might be the proper interpretation of why I chose to write that way. And only if I'm not the one really writing can I read what I've written and say, nira be'enai, this was my intention. Rav Kook did this also. Rav Kook with Reish Milin, right in the end, he said, I don't fully understand what this book meant. I'm not sure I ever understood what this book meant, so it's open to interpretation. Again, it's reflective, right? He's saying, I, here I didn't write uboira in, in the present tense. The language of creation. Here I'm referring to something ex nihilo, something that was created, something from nothing, an original instantiation of somethingness out of a previous nothingness. And therefore, I am not going to use that language of his galus, yesh ayin in a present tense. Now here, if anywhere, a person can really spend a lot of time kind of trying to understand the Tanya and what the Balatanya is describing in, in terms of what the Leshem is saying over here. But let's see. Let's go a little bit weiter. So we'll see. We'll see. It's not that there's a problem from the perspective of Olam Habriya. From the perspective of Olam Habriya, which is already a world of separation, there we have to make a fundamental distinction between the possibility of something emerging out of nothing versus something that is emergent from a previous cause. You're, yeah? So absolutely, absolutely. So there is a stira already in there is a stira already in the Arizal as to whether Bina, which is Bria, is going to refer to as Yesh or it's going to be Ayin. And like everything, what the Rasha shows us is that when there's a Machlokas or a stira in the Arizal, both are true in relative terminologies. Chachma or the world of Atzilus would be Ayin. Bina then can be referred to as a yesh me ayin. But we also know that keser can be referred to as an ayin, and chachma can be referred to as a yesh me ayin. And again, that just points to the dizzying concept of the relativity principle in Kabbalah, which means that there's never going to be a time where we get caught up in the terminology. It just demands understanding the perspectival point of where that terminology is coming from. I can't claim to, to really ever have had a full havana of this footnote. Agav, I want to say, I'm not, I'm not conveying this as someone who has grasp over it because I still, because on the one hand, if he's saying, the same question, if he's saying Bria means Yesh Me'ayin, then Lechari is not talking about Oilam Bria, and then this distinction of saying Hamachadish B'chul Yom Tamid wouldn't necessarily apply. I'm saying, the Leshem is saying, I don't want to speak of a perpetual creation of something out of nothing because we're in the worlds of separation at this point. We're in the worlds of Bria, which is already after the world of Atzilas, which is a major claim that Tamidim Hagra had on Divrei Hasidus, which really the fundamental point of distinction becomes what is the status of the Kalim of Bria Yitzir and Asiya. 
And so here the Leshem seems to be taking a sharp stance and saying that from the perspective of the world of Bria, in the language of Bara, you can no longer even play around with the language of ex nihilo. The Balatanya would say in Igeras Chaf, in Igeras Kodesh, he speaks of the Razid de Mehem Nusa, the secret of faith, which is unimaginable in its cognitive capacity, but nevertheless, what we know truly is that Malchus Datsilus that goes down into Bria does somehow, some way convey this power of, of Hesavus Yeshmeayin, which is, you know, a radical, a radical shift away. So I think the Lashem is saying something important here. Bevadai, Bevadai it does, because the Oilam Habria is still Nachshav. Why would we say, why would we say, if Bria is higher than Yitzira, right? We know the order of the worlds, but there are as we're going to be understanding them, is that after the Tzimtzum, HaKadosh Baruch Hu creates a Chalal HaPanui. We're going to see the Leshem's remarkable and radical redemptive perception of the Tzimtzum as well in the Sefer. After the Tzimtzum, there's the Adam Kadman, right? So first there's the Igulim that form in the circle and then in the innermost point of those igulim is going to be the yosher which is going to be the right, left and middle which is already the form of a, of a human being so to speak but really that's the true mushal to, that's the true nimshal to the mushal of our experience as human beings like the Shlach Adr says but in Adam Kadmon we don't speak about the lights that are in the innermost interiority of Adam Kadmon, we only speak about the lights that emerge out of the orifices of Adam Kadmon so to speak so we don't speak about the lights of of the eyes in and of themselves. We speak about the lights that come from the ears, from the nose, and from the mouth, which is referred to as achap, or that leads us to akudim, nekudim, and berudim. So after that, there becomes a formation of four worlds. Atzilus is the world of unity, where the kalim and the oros are unified together, and Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya are the three worlds of separation, which is the most delicate point and fundamentally the main point of what the Torah is coming to teach us. How do we relate to the worlds of separation? Are they really separate in some standalone capacity where the animating light and the annihilating light of the infinite is not present there? which would be a perspective of Tzimtzum Kapshuto, for example, or are we seeing them as things that are oimed lishaber, and anything that's oimed lishaber, it has a din of kisuse mechta shire, like an asherah tree, kavyachol, right? That an, you, a, a lulav is puzzled from an asherah tree. Why? Because be'emes, because the asherah tree stands to be negated in the future, therefore it doesn't have the, the capacity to provide the shear necessary for mitzvah observance. Ah, you have an actual object, but from a metaphysical lambda's perspective, the object does not exist because it doesn't have the capacity of actual shape. And that's the mashma'us in Chasidus, and that's the mashma'us in Rashash as well, that because these worlds stand to be negated in the future and to be revealed to have been nothing other than a dimyon, not a dimyon, but gradations of concealment, so then they don't truly exist at this point. And one can say down here as well, eno en milvado kipshuto mamish, which again becomes becomes the dangerous territory between how does one relate to the worlds of Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya. The gradation is, Atzilus is going to be, let's say, Chachma, right? And I'm deliberately, I'm, I'm meandering here just to bring out this point. Atzilus is going to be the Chachma of the individual, okay? That's the Yud of the Shem Havaya. That's a place of refined wisdom, a right brain orientation that sees all things in their holistic properties without distortion or differentiation. Then there's going to be Olam Habriya, which is going to be the Hei Harishona, which is associated with Bina. Bina Yosheves Ba'ilam Abriya, right? The entire concept of Bria is the concept of Bina, which is understanding. That's breaking ideas down into, into bite-sized manageable pieces. Then in the world of Yitzira, that's Avav. That's going to be the emotions. That's going to be Zer Anpin, that's Chesed, Gurut, Tferes, that's Achoy Yisoid. The Yud and the Vav, Chachma and Zer Anpin, are reflective of one another because they're both masculine, just as the first hay and the second hay of the Shem Havaya are reflective of one another. So you have the Yud, which is Olam HaAtzilas, which is Chachma. You have the Hay, which is Olam HaBriya, which is Bina. You have the Vav, which is Olam HaYitzira, which is all of the emotions, the Zion, the Zion, the, the Vak, the Vav Sviros of Chesed, Gurut, Tferes, Netzach, Hoy, Yisoyed. And then you have the Hay Tachtona, which is the Shechina, which is Malchus Deza, which is going to be just experience as a person. So, Bidera Klau, we obviously say that Bina is higher than, Bina is going to be higher than Zeranpin. Understanding the first Hay is going to be higher than the second Vav. But here we see in that Pasuk that Yoitzer Oribor Echoshech. 
we see Adaraba Ibcha Mastabra, we see that the lower level, which is the Vav Midos emotional experience, that's associated with light and clarity, which we know is expressive of all good things. But the higher world of Bina is here referred to as Choysha, who bara Choysha. So how could it be? How could you have this reversal? It's an Oilam Hafal Choysi. And here, all of the tzaddikim, almost in unison, and the Arizal expresses this as well, is that the qualities of Bina, the qualities of understanding, are qualities of concealment. Feminine qualities of minimization, of measurement, of concealment, of the ability to hold things and give shape to things. Now, at first glance, that appears to be a darkness in relationship to the level of emotional expression, which is just giving over whatever I'm feeling at that moment. But here we're seeing a fundamental shift at the heart of Panimiya Satora, where that which appears to be concealing, that which appears to be minimizing, that which appears to be more severe, is in truth very often, nearly always, from one degree or another, expressive of a stronger power on behalf of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so to speak. That Hashem's ability to conceal himself and our ability to conceal ourselves, Hashem's ability to make measure and our ability to live with measure is of a greater degree of spiritual strength and spiritual refinement than the ability to live with the abandonment of the self to the natural proclivity of self-expression. So that Simtsum is on a certain level higher than the Giloi. And over here we can say the Choyshech is associated with the higher world because that Choyshech there is representative of a darkness not because it's a concealment of a previous light, but it's a darkness that is higher than light. It's a darkness that precedes light. It's the silence that precedes speech and all of the wonderful kind of explanations that come from that. Does that make sense? So... Over here we're talking Yotzer Choshech, Yotzer or Bar Choshech, but the same would apply to Ra. Ra, Ra, as the Ramchal points out over and over, is just a Hastara. And the Koyach we know, Chazal say, right? Uh, where is HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Koyach? Where is his Noira? How can we say Noira about him? There's Goyim dancing in the in the Heichal, they're defiling everything, but we say, Ayeg Gvurosav, where are his Gvurosav? Hein Hein Gvurosav. This ability for HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kabyachu to conceal himself and to hold back and withdraw and withhold his presence is of a much greater expression, a much more essential expression of self than the ability to kind of give oneself over with full abandonment. <laughs> A fool, as Mishle says, kind of does not stop speaking. Uh, a silent person, at least there's some seichel there. It's much more. It's much easier to express the self ad infinitum. It's much more of a delicate ability to have that choishach. And there's another way of understanding this, which is that it's like when Chazal speak in euphemisms of a blind person. They refer to it as a sagi nahor, someone who has an inundation of light, a saturation of light. Meaning to say that when something is so bright and so so light, it's blinding to the eyes. So when we talk about Yoshev Cheshech Sisro, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sits in the darkness of concealment, that's not to say Hashem sits in hiddenness in a negative way, but it's when I contemplate where Hashem's resting place truly is, my mind confronts that place of Cheshech, which is the inability to understand. Which is... It's how we perceive evil of Ada, right? It's a, no, absolutely. So it would apply to both psukim. Uvarira, right? Uvarira, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And and one can say that the biggest chiddush is the first instantiation of the worlds of limitation, right? Because Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya are like stamps upon one another. That Yitzira is is just a stamp of what Bria is, and Asiya is just a stamp of what Yitzira is. The Chiddush is that all three of them are really ultimately the stamp of Malchus Silas, which descends down into exile to give life to all things, which is what we're searching for. So here, let's go weiter. Shemoy Nechtav B'Shem Havaya, the name of HaKadosh Baruch, whose essential name is written Yud Kei Vav Kei, V'Nikra B'Shem Aleph Dalid Nun Yud, right? It is, it is deliberately read at, not as it is written. V'Hinei, what does the Shem Havaya mean? Who nimtsakayim? What it means is he is found in existence. He exists. He is present in existence. Nimtsakayim. It exists. It's there. Hoiva. The right Salomar. What does that mean to say? Shemitsiyuso hu behoiva tamid. Vein bemitsiyuso avar va'asid. Perpetually present. 
No falling away into a past, no disappearing into a future, but rather an unbroken expression of full presence. Hoi That's the fundamental expression of the name. And yes, we know, as the Grub points out, that, and the Mephorshim point out, that the Shem Havaya means Haya Hoi and Yihye, it means past, present, and future. The implication being that present is just one part of the three-link chain. But what the Leshem is going to explain, that that's a secondary expression of the Shem Havaya. The truest expression of the Shem Havaya is Hoi Tamid Lamala Minazman. A presence that is far beyond the possibility of past, present, and future. So here, Sarot Salam, or what it means to say, his existence perpetually exists. And there's no past or future. A secondary explanation of this name is that it is that which gives life to existence. So it is the source of existence and it is what gives life to existence. Meaning, existed prior to the creation of the world as well. As the Pirkei de Rabbi Lazar say in one of the most enigmatic statements that become a key to understanding Pneumius, which is, Koidem shenivra o'ilam hayahu v'shmoi levad. That prior to the creation of the world, he and his name isolate, uh, existed in isolation. What are you talking about his name? The only necessity of naming is when there's somebody who can call out by that name so that I could respond to that name. Elama, HaKadosh Baruch Hu had all of the koyches possible, even the koyach towards manifesting in limitation, with or without a space to reveal himself. And so HaKadosh Baruch Hu had this shame of hoi tamid even before the possibility of a mahava. Mahava, the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu creates, is a secondary description of what the essence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. And the lack of creation, so to speak, would not be any proof on any level of the absence of the first postulate, which is Ho Hoi Vetamid. Al Shem Shakoil Hishavu Surak Mimenu. The reason it's called Mahava and someone who is giving life to creation is because all of perpetual unfolding of existence comes about through him. Vitali Loilam Rakbo, and it is always dependent only upon him, Shuhu Noisa Oisam Bakon Miluyam Kaniskar. For he carries them with all of their fullness and all of their expression, as we explained above. Let's go Viter so we can finish first parak in the next five minutes. Vihine. And now Al Shem Hisavu is Shahibizman. When it comes to understanding the name Mehave, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is creating something, because the notion of HaKadosh Baruch Hu engaged with any verb, which is Mehave, already implies the entrance into Zman. Mehave, M, implies it's coming from something. And if it's coming from something, it means that it's already operant within a space from whence it can emerge, which means that the beginning always happened already. The beginning had to always happen. If we're talking about an action, that means the time and the space continuum necessary for that action to take shape has taken place in that impossible to reach moment right before our awareness and our understanding. So, when we talk about Zman, Nivchan Ba'avar Vahoi So now we have the gradations of past, present, and future. So we said the fundamental explanation of Hashem's name is Hoi Tamid. And that also contains within it the possibility of being a Mahave. And once we begin to talk about being a Mahave, then we have the concept of Haya Hoi Vavihiyah. Because once we operate within the space of time, or the time of space, at that point things are broken up into that three-part triadic structure of past, present, future. Shehim Oisiyos Gimel Havayos. And this Hayo Hoivivyiyah, as the Gra points out in Sefer Yitzira, is going to be three Havayos, which are operant in three different parts of the mind. We're not going to go too deeply into that sugya. Amnan, and here the Leshem is going to begin with one of the most fundamental things. We just described what the name of Havaya means even before the possibility of creation. And one can come to think that, oh, his name, that Havaya before creation, must be that must be God himself, so to speak, which we said we have an absolute interdiction and usher against ever claiming we have grasp of. So, Amnan, however, after all is said and done, these two stages of Shem Havaya, Tamid and Haya Amnan the essence, so to speak, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, may his name be blessed, who be'emes tamid b'hoiveh, it's always perpetually present, and that is the fullest expression of the Shem Havaya Baruch Hu. The Hayra is the Shem Adnus. And why is it that we read the Shem Havaya as Adnus, as Adon HaKol? 
Who Adon Hakol? It means that he's the master of all things. Shu Mashkiach Bakol Uman Higesakol. That he is supervising all things and governing all things. Vuhu Baychin Vedan Es Kol Hamaasim. And he judges and he measures all actions. Kol Mash Nitzrach Lahaasos Bechol Hanemsa Im Kulam Bekiyumim Van Hagasam Shabachol Es. This. So here we have an opening. Of, of two stages. There's the Hoyvet Tamir of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which hints back to Atzmusi Yisparach, even though it's not Atzmusi Yisparach. That's the Hoyvet Tamid. That's the pure existence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, devoid of any past, present, or future. Then there's the entrance into the possibility of a Mahave, which is the, the action of that Hoyvet Tamid, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's ability to engage and create. And once we come into that possibility of Hashem as creator, so then we find that three-part breakdown of Haya Hoyvet All creation is going to be nimdad and measured in accordance with those three stages of time. Once we're operant in the space of time, so now we're no longer referring to the Shem Havaya even as it's written. At this point, we're referring to it by, by its way that it's read, which is Adnus, which implies now that you live in an existence of past, present, and future, that by definition is going to give birth to a myriad of properties and principles. Now Hashem's way of relating to that is by being a manhig and every moment guiding and supervising the upkeep and the continuity of all things that are taking place within the space of existence, Bezra Hashem. So again, like the Leshem said, it is natural to have more confusion, more questions in the beginning of learning something than it is to have clarity. But what the Leshem is giving us over here is the basic building blocks, Bezra Hashem, upon which we'll be able to move forward. Okay.